Well, good morning, everyone. Um, Kai, what an honor to be able to share this stage with you and to be able to bombard you with questions about this masterwork you've done on Robert Ames. I, it gave me the most thrilling August, reading it and then rereading it. I think one of your reviewers in the New York Times, I believe, said that you carefully built a case like a nest of twigs, not, go, not verging into any kind of hyperbole a, along the way. And in the era of homeland, this was not easy to do about the CIA. So let's just plunge in, start off and tell us what in the world gave you the courage to be able to think that you could penetrate the CIA for its secrets? <laughs> uh, chutzpah. <laughs> uh, well, to begin with, I didn't think I could do it. Uh, you know, it, it's an agency of secrets. Uh, but I, as a child, I spent most of my life in the Middle East. My father was a foreign service officer, and for three years I lived in Dahran, Saudi Arabia, and right next door throughout those three years was Robert Ames. And it was, he was a CIA officer stationed in Dahran, Saudi Arabia, and it was a very tiny little compound. This was his first posting abroad as a CIA operative. And I had no idea, of course, that he was a spy. My father knew, who was a regular foreign service officer. Um, but years later, you know, I, so I had vivid memories of him and his beautiful wife, who uh, um, looked like Liv Ullman, literally, of Norwegian background. Um, and she had two small babies. And uh, so I had vivid memories of him growing up. And then I later learned read in the newspapers that he had died in Beirut in this tragic truck bomb attack in 1983 on the, on the U.S. Embassy there, the first major sort of terrorist attack on a U.S. Embassy. And that stuck with me. I, I was always curious about this man. And so many years, many years later, I, uh, after finishing uh, crossing Mandelbaum Gate, my memoir about growing up in the Middle East, I was desperately looking for a new project. I googled his name and up came a court case, a civil suit, and I realized there were all these court records and his, his widow had testified. Uh, and that got my curiosity, so I thought, well, it, maybe I can't do a biography of a CIA officer, but maybe I could do a story about the U.S. Embassy bombing. And that got me started. So that's fascinating. Set the scene for us. I, for me, Beirut in the early 1980s is one of the most extraordinary, straight out of John le Carré settings that one could possibly have. Tell us a little bit about Beirut, late 70s, early 80s, and how Robert Ames came to be there for the CIA. Well, uh, Beirut was, in the 60s and 70s, early 70s, it was known as the Paris of the Middle East. It's, you know, a pearl right on the Mediterranean. I spent part of my childhood in Beirut. I went to the American University of Beirut for a year. It's, it was a fabulous city until the Civil War hit. Uh, Ames was stationed there in 1969, and uh, that is really the, sort of the beginning of the his, the substantive part of his career as a CIA officer. Uh, you know, this is a biography. It turned into a biography, improbably enough, um, which I'll explain later. But he was a fabulous CIA operative in that he was very good at his work. He was very good at making friends. And in 1969, he attempted to recruit Yasser Arafat's chief bodyguard a young man named Ali Hassan Salame. And Salame was a dashing young man, Palestinian, uh, of rather aristocratic background. And uh, the recruitment effort failed. Ali Hassan said no. But Ames then took it a step further and turned it into a friendship. And he cultivated him over the next few years. He's such a vivid character. Who's going to play him in the movie? You know, that kind of those slick suits <laughs> and the sports car. What was that fancy car, that, that $200,000 car he was driving around Beirut? The hit teams from the Mossad after him on a daily basis. I mean, what a movie this is going to be. 
Well, actually, there is a script writer in Hollywood <laughs> working on I'm a script sure there now. Is. So I'm sure I there hope is. There's going to be a movie, but I want Bradley Cooper to play Robert Ames. <laughs> okay, but but Robert Ames himself was such a fantastic. I mean, the visual of this man. What was he? Six foot five. He wore cowboy boots. I mean, he he he's he just just put him put him in a room for us. He, like, he, uh, you know, he was the son of a steel worker from North Philadelphia, working class. Uh, he'd gotten into the army, drafted in the army, and he, he wanted, he fell in love with the Middle East when he was stationed abroad uh, and joined the CIA. And he was indeed six foot three, six foot four, wore cowboy boots, so he looked even taller. Uh, he, he favored aviator glasses, tinted pink and, and yellow. Uh, you know, walking down the streets of Beirut, he stuck out like an American, oh, you, you know. There was no attempt to hide can his... You, and, he, and, he, and he reveled in this time. And one of the things that so intrigues me about your marvelous book is that Ames comes into the CIA at a time of seismic shift in the sort of the agency zeitgeist. He comes in in the era of the swashbuckling cowboys, the Archie Roosevelt, and then he's taken it, he becomes me mentored by Richard Helms. Can right. you tell us about that shift in the agency? Well, there was always a, a, a debate inside the CIA between sort of the cowboys and the, uh, the intellectuals. So this would have been late 50s? Yeah, well, even from the beginning, mm -hmm. 48. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, originally there, the notion was that you, had, uh, you were going to have a central intelligence agency that would uh, uh, take a few very good men, and they were almost all men then, and analyze the world. And Sherman Kent, when he was recruited in, by Alan Dulles in 1953 to come down and head the CIA's analytic division, uh, Sherman Kent was a famous Harvard professor of international politics, and, and he told Alan Dulles, well, I can't do the job if you give me more than 25 men. He wanted a small group. And that he course, could just control. That he could control. Like for sort and, of black ops. Well, also, well, these were analytical uh -huh. people. And so his notion was that he just wanted a, a few intellectuals to uh, use their best minds to analyze what was going on in the world. Well, of course, 50 years later, the agency is, a, is like over 25,000 people. It's mm -hmm. an enormous mm -hmm. bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. They stumble over themselves, and uh, the intelligence is sometimes not so intelligent. <laughs> so there was a great debate on top of this between the covert ops people and the analytical people. And Ames is interesting in that he, he was mentored, as you mentioned, by Richard Helms who had come out of OSS in World War II and had a very jaundiced view of covert operations. He had known that very few covert ops worked during World War II, that often things went wrong, that there were unintended consequences. So he was very skeptical of, you know, black bag jobs and, you know, the James Bond aspect of... And uh, assassinations. And, and assassinations. Undoing, right. undoing the, uh, the, the Iranians right. in the early 50s. But Ames was part of the covert ops division. Mm -hmm. He was a clandestine officer who was trained to recruit spies. But he was also an intellectual. And uh, Helms saw that. And uh, Ames was actually criticized by his other bosses for being too much of an intellectual. He's, he took too much time to study Arabic and to really learn the language. One of his bosses actually told him, you really don't need to learn that language. Yeah. Any of the people that we need to recruit or get intelligence from will know English. Yeah, that's a wonderful <laughs> moment in the book. And when, and when, <laughs> when no English. So the, the, the PLO and Yasser Arafat, the Middle East, we, Ameri the CIA puts its lens now on this kind of growing movement of the Palestinian Liberation uh, Organization and the strange little terrorist who is responsible for all kinds of destruction before it gets root. 
can you tell us a little bit about the background of the PLO and Yasser Arafat at that period, 70s? Yes, well, Arafat, you know, founded Al Fatah, uh, a, a sort of guerrilla organization for the liberation of Palestine in 1965. Uh, Ali Hassan Salame was then 23, 24 years old, and he joined Fatah in 65 as well. Uh, they began, you know, armed liberation struggle, which was very difficult and problematic, based in, initially in Jordan, and then they were expelled during the Civil War of 1970. Um, and so Ames appears in 1969 and forms this friendship with Ali Hassan Salome. And it, what he's doing is actually secret diplomacy. And I call the book The Good Spy because he was doing something good. Now, you know, I've been a critic of the CIA for most of my journalistic and, and uh, career and as an historian. But here he was trying to do something that was actually good and that he was going where uh, my, people like my father, a foreign service officer, could not go. Henry Kissinger and President Nixon had promised the Israelis that we would not talk to those terrorists. But by they 19, were responsible for many assassinations they were responsible and for Munich and the, you know, all kinds of mischief. In 1972, mischief. Munich, and there were allegations that Ali Hassan Salome was involved in Munich. So can you talk to these, quote, terrorists? And yet, if you don't talk to them, you're missing out on key intelligence from a major player and actor. You know, by 1970, the PLO controlled whole sections of Beirut and all the refugee camps. Um, and so what Ames was trying to do in his friendship with Ali Hassan was to turn him, to try to persuade him and through him Arafat that if they really were sincere about achieving Palestinian aspirations for a sovereign state and nationhood, they needed to put down the guns, they needed to start acting like a political party, they needed to start thinking about a compromise, a two-state solution. And uh, you can see this, this evolution in the PLO over the 70s while this relationship existed. And what, the extraordinary thing about what I was able to achieve in this biography is I found the proverbial suitcase of letters in the attic. That was my next which question. Which is every biographer's, yes. you know, uh, dream Absolutely. and worst nightmare if and you what letters they find were. It. Yeah, and what letters they were. Because, of course, in those days, they st the Ames had among his other wonderful qualities, a fantastic relationship with his wife, Yvonne, and wrote her, didn't he, extraordinarily detailed uh, letters about his meetings with this man he called Our Friend. So when you begin reading this, what, it was, what is your, I mean, what le leapt out at you from these letters? Well, you know, this wouldn't happen today because of email yes. and because the agency could track these emails, but in the 1960s and 70s, Ames would handwrite letters and stick them in the mail to his wife. And he would talk about his work. So through these letters, it turns out there were about 150 pages of handwritten letters on yellow legal pad, mm -hmm. usually. And you, you get a, a, a very intimate sense of what it's like to be a clandestine officer, the daily routine, how much writing you have to do. The, minu the minute notes that you yes. take on everything. One of, was Ames aware, um, your book paints of such an extraordinary portrait of this Bermuda Triangle of the wilderness of mirrors that Ames steps into in Beirut. You've got, on the one side, the Mossad who is tracking Ali Hassam Sulamed to try to assassinate him. You have Nixon and Kissinger in the White House forbidding any CIA officer from having any contact from with Arafat and his people. You have these rather elite, very well-educated characters, Ali Hassam Sulame and, and Mustafa Zen, who's my favorite character in the book all kind of jockeying around where everyone is kind of protecting each other and protect. Tell us, tell that wonderful story about the Mossad that making its first attempt to uh, assassinate uh, Ali Hassan Salome. 
Well, they, Mossad knew all about Ali Hassan Salame and who he was. They regarded him as a threat. They regarded him as a terrorist. And indeed, you know, he was, he was the complete opposite of Bob Ames, who wore uh, Sears and Roebuck suits. <laughs> Uh, Ali Hassan wrote, wore black leather jackets and he had a gold chain around his neck and he wore shirts half unbuttoned to show his hairy chest. And, and uh, he was a Muslim, but he loved red wine and beautiful women. And he married Miss Universe, and didn't he? he married Miss, Miss Universe, his yeah. second wife. <laughs> uh, he was very a very flamboyant character. But he also wore a pistol in his belt. And he had killed people. Uh, he was an enforcer for the PLO. He had ordered assassinations. He was a dangerous man. And the Mossad had him in their sights somewhat for retaliation, but mainly, it seems, because they did not want to have Yasser Arafat make any kind of peaceful overtures to the White House. It was in, it was in their interest to keep Yasser Arafat considered the terrorist of the world. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, it, it, you know, they tried to kill Ali Hassan Salama three times, and I went, and went to Israel and interviewed, I found four Mossad officers who had known Ames, and I asked them point blank, well, why were you trying to kill Ali Hassan? Well, the official line was that he was a terrorist, so we were trying to take him out. It was a defensive measure. But they also would acknowledge that there was a second reason. They knew that Ali Hassan was the back channel that Ames had opened up through for the CIA, that he was the channel to the White House, that he, he, was, he represented their worst nightmare, i.e. someday that Arafat might be invited to the White House grounds and, be, and that the PLO would be recognized by Washington. And so they were attempting to close this channel down. And on, in the first uh, assassination attempt, they sent him uh, a... Uh, a mail bomb, a letter, a, a, a letter bomb uh, disguised as a book. And Ames found out that this was about to happen, and he warned Salem not to open up mail in his apartment. The bomb arrived. It was taken through an excellent ray machine and discovered, and so Ali Hassan survived for a few more years. Then they attempted again. They thought they found him in... Uh, in 1973, in the summer of 73, in a little village in Norway called Lillehammer. And they sent a team of five Mossad agents to track him down and kill him. They shot a young man who actually was a Moroccan waiter. It was a case of mistaken identity. Uh, and then a few years later, in 1979, AIM, well, in the summer of 78, Ames learned that Mossad had been instructed by the new Prime Minister of Israel, Menachem Begin, that, to reactivate the attempt to kill Salome. And again, Ames warned Salome to beef up his security, to move out of his apartment, to vary his routes. But he was then, by then he was married to Miss Universe, Georgina Rizik, beautiful Lebanese woman who had been Miss Lebanon. And she refused to move into the Palestinian refugee camps. <laughs> and uh, he loved her, and he refused to move out of her, their nice apartment in West Beirut. And I, anyway, he was, he was killed by a car bomb. In tell, tell how it happened. I thought this was the most sad at its most extraordinary. Well, they sent in a team of 15 agents, and they tracked his his travels within the city, they sent in a woman to get close to him. She rented uh, a, an apartment on the route where he, they had discovered that he regularly took between Georgina's apartment and his office. And they packed a, a, a VW Volkswagen filled with plastic explosives on the street and one day as he drove by, uh, this uh, 
female Mossad agent pushed a remote control button. She was up on the balcony. On the balcony. And so in the movie, you'll see her, right? <laughs> and the car, his, he, but his entourage, he had an entourage he drove in, didn't he, with like bodyguards front and back. I just, I just saw that visual so clearly in your book. And she's up on the balcony and she sees his car coming and just goes, and then said that the Volkswagen blows up. And the Mossad officers <laughs> I interviewed told me that they had actually practiced this. Oh, really? Where? In Israel. Mm -hmm. And uh, they initially had a, a male agent. And the male agents, they tried a number of them, always mistimed pushing the button. <laughs> so they tried Chambers, who was the female <laughs> woman agent, and she did it correctly every time, so she was the oh. one who was sent into Beirut. Oh, that's hilarious. Well, no, there's such extraordinary characters and these personalities that jump up out of your book. For example, the American reporter Janet Lee Stevens, who was a, a, just, she was a feature of these uh, Palestinian refugee camps, sovereign and Shatila. Can you tell us about her? Well, she was uh, a young woman in her late 20s, early 30s by, by uh, the time she was killed in 1983. And she had been living in Beirut for several years. She spoke fluent Arabic. And when John Le Carré came to uh, Beirut to scout out the film locations for uh, the novel the little drummer girl that he was about to publish, he hired her because she was known to uh, the Palestinians and as a, a sympathetic reporter who knew her way around the refugee camps. And Le Carre and, and Janet Lee Stevens actually became quite good friends. And he, she was known in the refugee camps as the little drummer girl because she was so passionate about the Palestinian cause. And that's where he got his title. And that's where he got yes. the title for the novel. Incredible. And uh, she w was not known to Ames, but Ames arrived in Beirut uh, on a Sunday, uh, April 17th, and had a party at the CIA station chief's apartment down the street uh, where all, all eight CIA officers gathered to meet Ames, who was by then a very high-ranking CIA officer. And then the next morning, he walked into the embassy. And so too did Janet Lee Stevens, who was interviewing, as a journalist, she was interviewing uh, someone in the embassy. Uh, and precisely at 1.04 p.m., a truck bomb packed with 2,000 pounds of uh, explosives, manufactured, by the way, in the Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, crashed through the, the glass door of the front door of the embassy and the whole building came down, killing 17 Americans, all eight CIA officers, and 53 Lebanese civilians. So this was an Iranian hit, and the Iranian hit was motivated by what, exactly? Well, this was 1983. It was, you know, so sh just three years after the four years after the revolution, and uh, the Iranians were very unhappy with the American presence. There were Marines stationed as, quote, peacekeepers in Beirut, and this is in the wake of the Israeli invasion of, uh, during the summer of 1982, and uh, the Shiites of Lebanon were rising up demanding their rights and forming political parties finally with the backing of the Iranians. And the Iranians decided they wanted the Americans out because the American Marines, from their perception, were tilting, uh, though they were peacekeepers as such, they were tilting towards the Maronite Christian phalangist right-wing uh, elements in Lebanon in that civil war. And they decided to engage in uh, you know, a, a terrorist attack uh, initially against the embassy and uh, then six months later against the Marine barracks where they killed 241 servicemen. And both of these the truck bomb attacks, I mean, it, it was a mystery initially about who did this. Mm -hmm. And 
I believe, extraordinarily enough, I was able to solve the mystery. I actually named the mastermind of the attack, and I have a picture in the book of who, uh, uh, of him, and it's a shocking surprise about where this man is today. Oh, it, in, indeed it is, and we're not going to we're not going to ruin it for you. Uh, so, Kai, Kai, speak to us. We're all obviously so terrified about the state of the world today. It seems to me we've gone from the age of Al-Qaeda, the age of Beirut, to the age of Al-Qaeda, and now we're in the age of ISIS. But what was so compelling to me about the book was, if you read The Good Spy, you understand how we got to where we are today, and what was it that could have changed if Ames had not... What was Ames trying to reach for with Arafat? What, talk to us about the beginnings of fundamentalism as you discovered it during your reporting. Well, you know, as I said earlier, Ames was attempting to persuade the Palestinians that they would never achieve their aspirations with the gun. And indeed, Arafat began in this very crazy umbrella group called the PLO of many different factions, radical and otherwise, to push the PLO towards uh, the idea of a two-state solution. And the tragedy about what happened in 1983 is that not only was Ames killed, who was at that time America's most intelligent observer of the Middle East, a man who empathized with the Arabs, understood them, but also empathized with the Israelis. He, by that time, he regularly went to Tel Aviv to meet with his counterparts in the Mossad, who knew full well about his relationship with Salome and, and Arafat. Um, he was attempting to broker a two-state solution. And when the embassy was brought down in 1983, this was the tipping point. That was the end. It was sort of everything went downhill after that. Mm -hmm. If you recall, Reagan was president at the time, and uh, he launched a war against Grenada. That's mm -hmm. <laughs> sort of a diversion. <laughs> Makes sense. Makes sense. And then very a few months later, withdrew the Marines uh, after the Marine barracks were blown up. And gave up on attempting to uh, carry out the uh, Camp David Accords that had been negotiated by Jimmy Carter in 1978 and 79. And we just sort of let the Middle East simmer and the Palestinian cause just went by. And the settlements went on and, you know, everything failed. And it went into failure, dark, it spiraled. It, sp it began to spiral into darkness. And with the failure of the secular elements of mm -hmm. the PLO in particular, uh, and secularists across the Middle East, um, and civic society elements in Egypt and Beirut and, and Jordan, you know, that left a vacuum for young, angry, the bad guys men to sort of turn to religion and yeah. fundamentalists who, who railed against you know, the, the, these kings and dictators and generals who were allies of the Americans. There's a remarkable moment uh, in The Good Spy that takes place on the day that Arafat is to shake hands with uh, Yitzhak Rabin. Can you tell us about that and what happened inside the CIA that day? Well, that morning, uh, you know, I, one of the sources I found it was a retired CIA officer named Frank Anderson. And this is again one of the extraordinary parts of the, of, of the book and the, the sort of the surprising part of my journey as the author was to discover that I could not get any cooperation from the CIA officially. I had a meeting in the agency in Langley and they said, yes, yes, maybe we can arrange for some interviews for you, but nothing ever happened. But, you know, I had found the widow Yvonne, and she talked to me, and she gave me the letters eventually, and she gave me a few names, and then one name led to another, and one of them was Frank Anderson, and eventually I spoke to like 40 retired CIA officers, all of whom who had signed secrecy oaths not incredible. to talk to me about their secrets, but they incredible. did. 
Incredible. And Frank Anderson was one of them. He had uh, actually succeeded Ames into his job as chief of the analytical division for the Middle East. And on the day that you refer to um, in September of 1993, uh, you know, Frank woke up and knew that Arafat was scheduled to be in the white, on the White House lawn that, that morning. And he drove into the agency, and it should have been a, a, a good day for him. This is a man who had worked his whole career in the agency on, the, on Arab-Israeli affairs. And here, finally, something was happening, something good. And yet he was a little uneasy. He got into his office, convened his people, and said, well, who's representing the CIA at the ceremony? You know, Bill Clinton had invited 3,000 guests mm -hmm. <laughs> to witness this, but uh, it turns out not one CIA officer, not even the CIA director. And inside the agency, they sort of believed that Ames had started this process that led to Oslo by opening up this back channel to Ali Hassan Salome and pushing the Palestinians in this direction. And so uh, Anderson said, okay, he turned to one of his aides and he says, get a couple of buses and, and round up 40 young uh, clandestine officers and analysts and we're going to go visit our dead. And so he, they drove these young officers over to Arlington National Cemetery and at the moment when Yasser Arafat and, and a very reluctant Yitz, Yitzhak Rabin were shaking hands, they were standing around Robert Ames' gravesite. This is where the movie should start, you know, a split screen. And I, with that, with that, I think we need to take some questions. I'm getting the high, I'm getting the the uh, the hook here from our wonderful assistant. Who has questions for Kai Bird? Um, did you see the documentary film The Gatekeepers? And if so, what was your reaction to the uh, interviews with the former Shin Bet and Mossad uh, leaders? Yes, I did see the movie. It's, it's a very good documentary, and it was no surprise to me because, you know, it's been known f for a long time that any intelligent Mossad officer and Shin Bet, in this case, understand that they need to make peace with their neighbors, the Palestinians, and that Israel's greatest sort of national security threat is the one-state solution. And time is running out, and facts are being built on the ground. And uh, so it, the gatekeepers, all, it's an extraordinary film in that these Shin Bet, five or six of these former Shin Bet, sort of the FBI of Israel chiefs, all come on camera and uh, sort of, they're protesting their own government's policies. And so it's an extraordinary eye-opener in that way. More questions. Here you are, sir. Most fascinating story. I always wonder, I always wonder, when you write on a topic like that, are you worried about giving away some secrets that might help the enemy? And so is there a, is there a line between freedom of expression and the security of the country? Do no. you feel any? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like that, but uh, but you are comfort as an author. You are comfortable with that. Well, I'll tell you. At one point in Tel Aviv, I was sitting in the living room of a very high-ranking retired Mossad officer, and I was doing what journalists do. Marie knows this very well. I was uh, demonstrating to him early in our to our meeting how much I already knew <laughs> by telling him stories, mm -hmm. hoping that he would then, you know, kick in and say, well, actually, it wasn't quite that way. That old was trick. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so at one point, he, he stops me and he says, now, wait a minute, Kai, are, is your government actually going to let you publish all these secrets? <laughs> and I said, you know, we don't, I, we, you're thinking of England. They have an official secrets act, but not in America, and I haven't signed any secrecy oaths. So, yes, I'm publishing this. <laughs> and did you get anything out of him then? Oh, he went on to tell oh. me more secrets. <laughs> Good work. So it worked. It worked. <laughs> Who else? <laughs> I've, wait for, I got a microphone for you. 
Here comes the microphone. <laughs> there's a lot going wrong now in the Middle East and obviously Syria. There's, there's a lot going wrong now in the Middle East and Syria and obviously there's a lot going on in Iran, Israel. Is Lebanon still consequential? Are there things that, um, you know, is there a tipping point in, in Lebanon? I mean, there was a lot, obviously, in the 80s, but is it still a consequential country by way of foreign policy? Yes, absolutely. Lebanon, I believe, is actually the, the crucible. It's, Lebanon and Beirut has always been sort of the intellectual um, headquarters of the Middle East. It's where the American University of Beirut is that has trained, you know, thousands of doctors and lawyers for all over the, the region. Um, and Lebanon today, you know, is uh, controlled in large measure by Hezbollah. It's a, it, it's a legitimate political party. Uh, it controls a plurality of the assembly. Uh, probably half of the population of Lebanon today is Shia. Um, and their allies are the Iranians. And so one of the really interesting unspoken facts that you don't hear coming out of Washington now is that with this Iran deal, where we have put at least 10 to 15 years of constraints on the Iranians to uh, not build, not to weaponize their technology. And, you know, I wrote a book on Robert Oppenheimer, so... Uh, I know, as Oppenheimer knew, that any country, however small, however poor, after Hiroshima, would be able to build this weapon if they chose to decide to do so. And uh, we, this deal now, I think, is a good thing for 10 or 15 years. And that'll give time for the liberals, the moderates, and the Iranian population, which is all under, you know, the majority of them are all under the age of 30 and they're champing at the bit to uh, get on Facebook. <laughs> uh, and what's happening is a sort of a possibility for a transformation of the Middle East through the revival of the Shia uh, populations, who are, in a s s sort of religious sense, the liberals. Mm -hmm. It's the Sunni Wahhabi yes, yes. elements of the Saudi uh, missionaries who've spent the last 40 years uh, proselytizing mm -hmm. this fundamentalist Wahhabi Sunni yes. tradition. The, the Shiites produced the Sufi liberalism. Yes. Traditionally, people forget because of Khomeini, but the, in this, the Shia tradition, the mullahs are supposed to be apolitical. They're not supposed to be part of politics. Yes. You see that enlightened Shiism, particularly in India, in Lucknow, and the, the, this beautiful parts of India. We think we have time for one or two more questions. Who has a question? Way in the back. Okay. I, I saw this gentleman first, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, 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 Sky News, uh, a, a Murdoch uh, outlet in England, uh, had a report which apparently has been uh, now published in the New York Times and the Washington Post that Iran has released a number of al-Qaeda leaders that they've had under house arrest. Is this a sign that the hardliners are, are asserting themselves in Iran <laughs> just like the hardliners are asserting themselves in this country trying to, uh, they tried to kill the Iran deal? Uh, I, ha I had not seen this report, but, you know, it's possible, and yes, there are, you know, Iran, like any country, has a complicated politics, and there are indeed hardliners and, quote, moderates. Remember the Iran-Contra scandal under the Reagan years? I mean, the, the Reagan administration was attempting to make a deal with the moderates, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it's it's... It's happening again, and, and there's a power struggle going on. One more question. Thank you. You have a question also concerning uh, Iran. Yes. Uh, my uh, thoughts on on uh, the assassination of Mossadegh. Um, 
was the, the revolution, the 1979 revolution would not have happened if Mossadegh hadn't been taken out by the United States and the Brits. And um, it's because he, he was really looked upon as a, almost as a Gandhi figure of the Middle East. Uh, he was one that uh, is considered would have united the Sunni, the Shiite, the Baha'i. And um, I also asked this question to Shuri Ibani, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate of Iran. And she also agrees that the revolution of 79 would not have happened if we would not have taken out Mossadegh. What is your opinion? Well, what you're posing is what historians call a counterfactual, and we'll, we'll never know. <laughs> but I, I, I would tend to agree with you, yes. You know, we didn't assassinate Mossadegh, but we did launch a coup d'etat against him, and it was organized in part by Kermit Roosevelt, one of the sort of cowboys, cow cowboys of the CIA clandestine services. And uh, it, was, it was crazy politically because uh, Mossadegh was a liberal, secular uh, leader in, uh, in Iran at the time in 1953, and he, he was a nationalist. And it was sort of in a, uh, it was all about oil and defending British and, and American oil contracts. And uh, if, Mossadegh had been allowed to stay in power. Iran may have evolved into a parliamentary system. Uh, the opposition to the Shah, which grew and grew and grew over the decades, uh, and coalesced around this, this um, fundamentalist leader named Ayatollah Khomeini, that wouldn't have happened. And uh, so it's a, it's a great tragedy, and it's an example of, again, once again, of, of we Americans not knowing <laughs> how complicated the Middle East is and how little we belong there except as tourists and observers and appreciate, uh, you know, observers of, of the culture. That should be it, and, and we should stop intervening. And I, I, I just want to say, Kai, thank you so, so much. I have been your deep admirer since Robert Oppenheimer, and I'm so looking forward to your next book on Jimmy Carter. Well, thank you. This has been terrific. A great interrogation. <laughs>